next speaker is Gary Gaff. Can I do one? Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, thanks to the organizers and our host for uh, bringing this workshop together. It's a big pleasure for me to be here. And uh, yeah, I slightly changed the title compared to the book of abstracts, almost the same content, but I thought that, uh, that fits uh, also uh, nicely to this, to this workshop here. Because what we are doing essentially in our experiment is studying dissipative impurities in ultra cold quantum gases. And this is actually realized with charged particles, as you will see. In our case, these are electrons. So the outline of my talk is the following. I will introduce to you two different effects that can happen when you have a dissipative impurity in your gas. I will show you how this can lead to quantum zeno dynamics in the Bose Einstein condensate, a special transport property that we have uh, analyzed at the tunnel junction, and that will be important to understand the main part of this talk which is the uh, defect induced incoherent and superfluid transport. And that shows you that also when you have an, a dissipative impurity, you can observe <coughs> coherent effects provided your overall system still is coherent. And if time allows, I show you some alternative interpretation of these results at the end of this talk. So the overall idea of this work in our group is that we want to tune and engineer the environment to steer a uh, many-body quantum system. And there are various uh, effects or things you can do. For instance, you can uh, prepare certain quantum states. You will see an example, a simple example for that. In general, if you have an open quantum system, the dynamics can be well an attractive dynamics, which leads you a nice way to reach the state that you want to prepare here. If you have an attractor state in your system, then it is automatic. It is at the same time the mechanism that stabilizes your quantum state, because if you deviate from the state, you can come back to the state. Uh, if you have a small perturbation on that, um, you will see our dissipative ambiguity will lead to losses. And if you combine losses with gain, you are in the world of non-Hermitian Hamiltonians, where you have imaginary parts in your effective Hamiltonian uh, descriptions. Um, another important aspect in open systems is the appearance of phase transitions that you can uh, observe there. And generically, when you have an open system, so in our case, when you remove something from somewhere, you typically induce a transport, and uh, this talk will be about these transport processes or some of the transport processes that you can observe. Now, let me start with uh, uh, what our main dissipation mechanism is, and this is local particle loss. If you consider a 1D system, here atoms tunneling in a 1D system, a leaky optical lattice, then you can describe this with a master equation approach. Here you see the time evolution of the density operator, which has the, the coherent uh, part, and here it is cut into the environment, described in this link platform here, where you have certain operators here that act on your density matrix. In our case, so in this particular case, where you remove particles from certain lattice sites, these operators are nothing else than the annihilation and creation operators for the boson at each site. And at the rate that you have here is the loss rate, so that's the speed with which you remove these particles. And it has been on theory side, uh, uh, the theory side considered in several publications here. Um, we, you will see examples <coughs> for a modification of this uh, uh, scenario later on, but we will also study the continuous part of it. So if you have a bar system, and that can now be a Bose-Einstein condensate, for instance, and have you have a local impurity, and this impurity just gives you losses, then this will be uh, the appropriate form. And compared to the previous one, you simply replace the annihilation operators with the field operation operators, and then you have the the open system uh, description of that. And if you have now many atoms, as we have in a both Einstein condensate, then you can make a mean field approximation of this. And if you do that, you end up with this equation that describes then your both Einstein condensate here. And you see, you recover the gross pitayevsky equation up to this part here with the kinetic energy, the external potential, and the interaction energy. And what is now new, if you have local losses, is that you have an imaginary potential. That's the effective result of this. Uh, it is uh, the strength of the potential is directly given by the loss rate and how fast you remove the material from that. Let's briefly discuss what an imaginary potential can do compared to a real potential that you all know. Uh, that can be simply studied in a 1D model where you put a complex potential barrier here that has a complex amplitude 
which means physically, if that is right, what I told you, there are losses in this region of space from zero to d with a certain strength, and no losses here and here. And if you just write down this uh, Schrödinger equation with an imaginary potential, you can solve it with a potential, uh, with a normal ansatz, but the wave vectors that you include have to be complex, so they can also become imaginary to describe a damped wave. And uh, then you get, and if you sub, uh, look at such a scattering experiment, you have an incident wave from one side, and you get a reflected and a transmitted wave that you know from the conservative part, but you also get some missing probability, which uh, is the dissipated part of the uh, wave function. You can calculate the amplitude of all these three contributions, independence of the strength of your losses, so how strong the losses are, and um, the blue one, first of all, is the, the transmitted one. That goes to zero, which is certainly not at all surprising. Already a bit more surprising is the red one, that you get reflection here. But at the end, it's uh, a wave phenomenon that you can observe here. Right? There is a wave traveling from here in an area where there is absorption. So in the language of uh, electromagnetism, you would say there is no impedance matching here, so, and then there is always a reflected part here. And that's what you see, that's the red part here. And uh, for us, interesting is the green part, and that is the amount of atoms that you remove, or the amplitude of the wave function that is removed when it enters here, this, um, this interaction area here. And you see this has a local maximum, and then it goes down. And uh, interestingly, in the limit of infinite potential height here, the green curve goes to zero, which means that you have, if you have infinitely losses, then this imaginary potential barrier acts exactly in the same way as a conservative one, the only result being that there is a boundary condition for your wave function that then has to be zero at this transition. And the dashed lines that you see here are the corresponding calculations for the conservative potential barrier. So you see an uh, imaginary potential is not so special, but it has this particular additional branch that can occur, and that will be, become important uh, later on. Now, what do we do in the experiment? I told you we make a dissipative impurity, and we do this by local losses. And the local losses, in our case, are realized by an electron beam. There's a focused electron beam, high energy, 6 kV, whatever the electrons hit is removed from the sample. So it's a pure loss mechanism. However, I think, when we can discuss this, that this is quite generic. If you have an ion in, your, in a trapped sample and you, you rapidly shake the ion on purpose, then I can imagine that you end up in a similar situation. If you get a lot of losses, strong losses induced by the ion, and then maybe you end up in a similar situation that is discussed here. So we have this electron beam, which comes from a commercial electron column. And our, the electron beam does two things. So first of all, it removes particles. Second, a part of the particles is uh, ionized, and these ions are then detected. So we also see the debris of our milling actions here, which is quite useful. The technique is, uh, has a high spatial resolution, so we can make small defects. For us, it's small in a you know, algebra quantum gas length. Well, 100 nanometer is a small quantity. Uh, we can scan it, uh, scan it around, and well, that's essentially the beam diameter here. It's single atom sensitive because we get the signal from every atom, not from every atom, but from the single ions that we produce. We can use this for making images. That was what we had done at the beginning of this uh, uh, technique, which is already a couple of years old. Um, it works in situ. And what will become important later on, it's an in vivo technique. So we can continuously observe the system for a certain time. And at the end, you will see that it's also a nice tool to manipulate and prepare density. density. Now we can use this, we prepare a Bose-Einstein condensate in an optical dipole drive and we sum over many pictures and then we see, for instance, here the density distribution, you see high precision, nice images and that there is also high resolution. I can show you qualitatively by showing you these pictures of a Bose-Einstein condensate that has been loaded in a two-dimensional optical lattice here. Each side that you see here has about 80 atoms. Here, these, pan these lines are pancakes because this is only a one-dimensional optical lattice. And you see that we cannot only resolve the lattice sites, but we can also remove atoms from lattice sites prior to making the image. So this is the technical part of what we can do. 
Now let's come to the to the physics, what we want to study. The first one is now quantum zeno dynamics in the post Einstein condensate. The basic setting is quite clear. We're going to create a dissipative defect, so a local loss in an ultra cold quantum gas here, it's a Bose Einstein condensate. Now if we look at the signal over time, then we see that uh, so what is plotted here is time, and here ions per microset, and this is the rate of material that is removed from this point here. And this rate first goes down, has some transient dynamics, and then enters into a steady state. And you can imagine this steady state has a balance between what you remove from here and what fills in from here and from here. Because at the end you have a very small defect here, 100 nanometer, and the whole cloud has a dimension of 80 micrometers, so it's about not, not 1,000, but 800 times uh, larger. So we have a lot of reservoir size, and that allows you to observe this steady state here, but I should mention that maybe at the end of this room here, the signal is also to zero because I mean, you remove the particles, and at the end, they are gone. Now, I told you that uh, a local loss should be, able, should be described by an imaginary potential, and that can lead to reflection of the wave that goes into the potential. We have studied this by looking at the overall loss that we observe in the first five milliseconds, so everything that we remove from here to here, so the integral uh, below this curve, for different beam currents. Now, this is now the strength of the electron beam, so the strength of the imaginary potential. This is what we, uh, what we remove, and uh, the free graphs are for three different diameters of the electron beam. And you see that for the smallest two diameters, you can see an increase of the signal, and then the signal goes down. And this is the effect of the imaginary potential here. You can see it also here, and here it's maybe no longer really visible within the arrow bars. Now, the, the description, the orange curve that you see here is a direct modeling of the time-dependent Grosz-Petajewski equation, where we put here the imaginary potential here. So you see that the imaginary potential in this mean field picture is a good description for this uh, loss process. Now there is one additional thing I would like to tell you about this, and this is if you look, we just take one of those curves here, we can divide it into two parts. Because the, the beam current here can also be converted in a central dissipation strength, so this is the, the value given in kilohertz, and then we can draw another line Roughly, let's say, this is the blue dashed line here, and that is the time scale which is given by the interaction of the BC. So it's a chemical potential in our case, and that tells you what is the strength of the unitary dynamics. And when you are left of this line, so it's a more qualitative argument here, then um, the, the H here, this is the chemical potential here, so what the quantum physics is doing is much more important than this one here because the time scale for this is smaller than that and this is why the unitary dynamics uh, dominates and on the other side here um, when you want to see this effect that the overall the reflection sets in you have to overcome with your with your dissipation the coherent dynamics in the system in order to observe that, that and here the non-unitary part uh, dominates so whenever you have the problem of seeing dissipation in your system in the one or the other way, it might be worth considering the, the situation where the dissipation is not as strong as the coherent dynamics and you might still see uh, some unitary uh, dynamics and I will show you an example for that at the end. So, I also show you we try to image the whole that we do and um, I show you just, this was just a line scan taking after we have drilled a hole with the electron beam. Uh, here, so this is roughly the electron beam. This is a density scan through the BEC, and here you see the hole. And I just want to point out, we also have some numerical simulations here of this cross petersky equation that you see that there are some wiggles, wiggles on that, so it's not only just a simple hole, but it has some structure. And I will use this argument at the end uh, once again. Now, in the, in the second part of this talk, I will again consider a dissipative impurity, but now it is sitting on a discrete potential. It's, it's a one-dimensional optical lattice, and each lattice side consists of uh, about many hundred atoms, so it's a pure mean field problem here, and 
because the BDC looks like that, and the light is going in that direction. We have a stack of pancakes in this direction. And um, that system uh, is very old in the field of optical atoms, goes back to early work in Florence, and is typically considered a Josephson junction array, so I've had just coupled condensates. And uh, we make the particular division of, the, of this system by, by choosing one of the central sites as our dissipative impurity, as our local lossy site, and the rest of it left and right as a reservoir of atoms where the atoms can go into this site here. Now, the first thing that I have to tell you in order that you understand the second part of this um, experiment is the precise microscopic physics, what happens at this tunneling junction between one side and another one. So normally, if you have one lattice side and another one, you just write down a J, which is a tunneling coupling, and that is what you do with a bose hubbard uh, type of model. Here, the situation is a bit more complicated, because each lattice side here is in the transverse direction a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator. So it's not a single mode, 1D, bose hubbard model, not at all. It has many modes, and um, these modes have some radial extent that is indicated here by these diagonal lines here. Now suppose you have the situation that you have a full lattice site here with a few hundred atoms there, all filled up to the chemical potential in this particular site, and you have this neighboring to an empty site. <coughs> the empty site has no atoms, there is no interaction energy, the world, the world uh, exists only in terms of single particle states. Now the radial oscillation frequency of this two-dimensional the oscillator is smaller than the chemical potential. It's much smaller than the chemical potential, about eight states. Which means that if you were a boson that wants to tunnel from this full side into the empty side, first of all, you have to obey uh, energy conservation. And uh, well, no, that's what you have to do. And then you, the consequence for you is that you have to tunnel into a radially excited state. You cannot tunnel into the ground state. Remember, it's empty. Um, because there's just this energy mismatch given by the chemical potential because you don't have interaction energy. You have to go in this state, and then what the basic result is that you get a reduced effective tunneling because um, your transverse wave function does not match. So here, in the full side, you have a kind of a mean field transverse wave function, which is a simple Gaussian wave function. But here, in the empty side, you have the Hermite polynomes of the harmonic oscillator, which are oscillatory, and that's why the effective tunneling coupling from here to here is reduced. And the essence is that the tunneling coupling J depends on the difference <coughs> in atom number between the wells. If you have the same number of atoms in both wells, then you have the normal J that you can calculate. If you have a different number, the J becomes smaller. And this is now a consequence on the refilling dynamics. So we start with an initially empty site, and we just look how all the atoms fill up fill up the neighboring sites, and uh, you see, first of all, they fill up the sites, so this is the filling level over time. You see that for smaller tunneling couplings here, given the J over H bar, it takes a longer time, and then if you increase tunneling, it's getting faster. But what is more important is that you see these kind of, well, S-shaped behavior, that's visible maybe at the red, at the blue curve. And we wanted to understand what uh, what this particular transport dynamics is, and that's why we convert this plot now in a current voltage characteristic, so in a transport characteristic. We take the derivative of the, of the experimental data as the actual current, so the number of particles per time that move from the full side into this initially empty side, and then we also convert the actual atom number difference, because we, we measure the refilling here, so we know how, how full the side is, uh, in difference in chemical potential. And then we interpret the difference in chemical potential as a driving voltage and the resulting particle uh, transport as a current. And the final result is that one here. This is now, if you, if you look at this refilling dynamics, now you have to read the plot from right to left because here the difference in chemical potential is zero and here the difference in chemical potential is maximum. So which means here we go along this line here, this is the current versus the difference in chemical potential. You see first you get a straight line. This is what you know from a resistive behavior here. More driving force, more current, but then it turns over, goes down, and uh, this is then the appearance of negative differential conductivity. You increase the driving force, but you get less current. 
The reason is the intrinsic nonlinearity of the power decoupling. That is quite specific to this, uh, to this system. Okay, now that was kind of an intermezzo to now study what you have in analogy to the BC experiment that I showed you before, when you do exactly the same experiment in this one-dimensional Josephson array. So we consider this situation here. We have all the sides coupled to each other. We now remove atoms from one side. This is our dissipative defect. And uh, just as in addition, uh, we have a tunnel coupling that depends on the filling. Right? That's this J prime depends now on n, and this is the number of atoms of atom field. This again was a similar Josephson models have been studied before, but mostly in the context of the AC Josephson effect, where you see oscillations between S. What you see now is the realization of a DC Josephson effect. So if we now do the experiment, and we start again, as in the case of the BEC, we start with a full lattice side, this is the initial condition, and then we switch on the loss rate in the side. The question is what's happening. And um, the result is very trivial, but very surprising at the same time, because the result is that nothing happens, almost nothing. This is time now, 80 milliseconds, it's a long time. And you see that this is the filling level of this site when we start to remove particles, and you can see it just stays constant. So in contrast to the BEC case, there is no hole that we draw. Remember in the BEC case it went down and then there was the steady state here, it stays flat. Even though, so even though this looks boring, this is a very peculiar result here, and we wanted to understand it better. And first, want to, I want to state that there is a constant signal here, within the arrow bars here. Um, so there is a constant density everywhere, but don't forget we are removing particles from here, right? Um, this goes on for another few 10 milliseconds, and then of course it goes down because the overall atom number is decreasing. Right? Okay. Let's have a look at the under underlying microscopic description. So I told you this is a Josephson array, so we can try to, to, to model it with a discrete nonlinear Schrödinger equation that you see here. So this is well known, this part here. You have, if you consider your lattice side psi n, then it can has a tunnel coupling to the two neighboring sides, n minus one and n plus one. It has an interaction energy because the atoms interact with each other. And now we have one uh, loss rate here. Uh, given here with this, with this delta function here. And the surprising thing is that, or not surprising, but an interesting thing is that indeed, for this type of uh, discrete Schrodinger equation, you find a steady state that fulfills exactly what you need to, to, uh, to uh, describe the experiment. You have the same filling everywhere, so the, the modulus of psi n is equal to the overall, to the, the atom number in each side, and you have a finite phase difference between adjacent states. This is then a superfluid state, obviously, and it reads like that. That's the explicit solution for the steady state. And you see that the phase difference that you need in order to create the two Josephson flows from left and right is exactly depends on the loss rate gamma. So if you change gamma, you change the phase gradient, and you adjust this superfluid current. You can also think of this in, the, in terms of a band structure here, in a single particle picture here. Initially, all your atoms are here at, uh, at rest in the center, so you have no quasi momentum. Now you start to remove atoms from the center, you get two input flows from left and right, and uh, the, the group velocity of them simply depends on your dissipation rate. So the theory supports what you, what you observe in the experiment. Now, we observe here obviously a superfluid transport because we do not have any difference in chemical potential. We have the same feeling everywhere. Nevertheless, we see a motion of atoms. Um, so that is superfluid flow here. And we can first test how long this superfluid flow survives. So what you see here is an increase in the dissipation rate gamma, so stronger and stronger loss. And this is the feeling level. And you see that up to a certain critical value of gamma, we always observe the, observe the same behavior. It remains full, and then it suddenly drops down here. So there is a breakdown of superfluid transport somehow here. Now let's first also extract the current voltage characteristics, because when we look at the steady state, we can say that the change in atom number in this central site is given by the number of atoms that you remove minus gamma times the actual number that you have 
plus the current that flows from the side here. And in the steady state, this is zero, so you directly get the current that goes into the side. And now we, so we have the current that flows into the side, and then we can also measure the difference in chemical potential by just looking at the difference in atom number. If the atom number is the same, we say the difference in chemical potential is zero. And you see that for, now for all these points here, the difference in chemical potential is zero, but we see a current, so which pile up to this uh, here in this current delta mu, current voltage characteristics, and then you see the, the other points down here with a finite difference in chemical potential, and it tells you that uh, this is actually the same type of current voltage characteristics that you know also can you also measure in superconductors. It's not so surprising because you have a superfluid, so you remove particles here, and the superfluid can just flow without friction into that defect, and this is what we observe here. But there is more. Because we have an intrinsic nonlinearity in this tunneling junction, we can change the system by only changing the initial condition. So if we initially empty this side here, then um, we see some dynamics like that. This is now a single trajectory over time. This is the filling level of this side here. So it goes up to a certain point, and then again, there is a steady state. Now there are several possibilities. This can fill up completely. Uh, to the upper part, and then you end up in the same situation as before, then the initial condition is not important. However, you can also find situations like here, where for the same dissipation strength, the final steady state, these are two, um, two trajectories here, really depend on the initial condition. And that is uh, a bias, intrinsic bistability in the system that you can observe, which has its origin in this atom number dependence tunneling coupling. So here, if, if we just look at this part here, for this dissipation strength here, we can say that here, the superfluid response is very strong and, and the loss rate is, does not manage to, to make a defect, to make really a density there, because the superfluid transport prevents this. But when you already have an empty site here, you have no superfluid transport anymore because you have a difference in chemical potential. The atoms have to kind of somewhere go from here to here, but certainly not in a superfluid way. And that's why, for the same dissipation strength, you can keep the side empty by just removing this little amount of atom which goes into that side here. So there is the appearance of bistability, shown here, but there is more. And um, this is just, if you just look at this graph, you can, sh I argued a lot that when you see unit filling, you have a superfluid transport towards your dissipative impurity. But of course, if you have very, very strong losses, you end up in a situation where you have an empty side and a full side and you have some atoms dropping there. And for sure you would call this an incoherent transport, right? There is no defined phase or by function or you may do not even expect a condensate existing in this side. So if you just follow, for instance, the red line here, uh, you must see a transition. And um, there, is a, there is a star here and the question is what happens there. Remember, this is now a regime where your site is partially filled. So it's not full, it's not empty, but it's yeah, kind of in between. So here it's superfluid, here not, so is there a phase transition in between? So what we have looked at is exactly around this point here, this is dissipation strength gamma, on the initial dynamics. How long does it take to reach the steady state? This is a measure of how important uh, fluctuations in the system might be. And you see that the time scale on which you reach the steady state indeed di diverges or becomes large at one point and then it drops down. So it looks like, uh, we have not a complete understanding of this, but it looks like a slowing down. And we think, we speculate that this is connected to a phase transition to a Bose-Einstein condensate that takes place in this central, in this central part here. And um, that, uh, yeah, is uh, an effect of, on the one hand, having the atoms want to condense, on the other hand, you remove the atoms, but you have also a strong flow of atoms from the neighboring side here. Um, what is important to know is that this happens roughly at a filling of 30-40%, but just from calculation, you expect in equilibrium a condensate to uh, form already at a, at a filling level of 10%. So we think that this is a strong deviation from that, because you have these strong losses. So you are far away from thermal equilibrium. Nevertheless, we think it is a phase transition 
because also another indication for us is that if you sum up the density profiles on the left side on the red points and compare them to the density profiles on the right side here, the left side is the blue one, the right side, the red points is for this part here, you see the blue ones is a little bit smaller and it is also compatible with the idea that for lower dissipation strength here, we have a condensate. I mean, for these points, for sure, we expect to have a condensate. We find this for every for every dissipation strength. It's a quite it's a quite uh, robust phenomenon here. If the tunneling dominates, then there is always the superfluid transport in the defect. If, of course, the dissipation dominates, you expect just having low atom high number and some dropping of atoms, and in between, we see the bistability region. So at the end now, I give you a completely, uh, almost completely different interpretation of the superfluid transport in terms of what has been called coherent perfect absorption. This is something that was pushed forward. We have two slides, okay? That was uh, that was uh, pushed forward by uh, Dr. Stone in 2010, and he uh, was considering the question. Can you make a perfect absorber for light? So is there something like an inverse lasing process that you send a laser into some media and you can be sure that 100% of the laser light is absorbed? <coughs> that is what they call in that paper the coherent perfect absorption. And uh, they come up with this setup here and they also have uh, studied this experimentally with a laser slab. And uh, it works like that. It's easy to understand from a qualitative point of view. You take an absorbing medium that you have here, and you have incoming laser radiation from left and right. It also works with only one side, but here, to compare it with our experiment, we take it now having laser radiation from left and right with the same frequency. Now we have some mirrors here, here and here, two mirrors. And now what does coherent perfect absorption mean? It means that all the radiation that goes here in from both sides is dissipated here and does not reappear. So it's neither effectively transmitted nor reflected. So there is no part of the wave that goes out in this direction and in this one. And it can be realized because you can tune, you can make an interference between the transmitted waves and the reflected waves. So um, consider now this incoming radiation from left. So you can say that after being bouncing back and forth and being absorbed, there is a certain uh, reflected part of this wave. And now consider the laser which comes from the right. After interacting here with that, there is a certain transmission of that. And if these two are out of phase and have the same amplitude, they, deconst they yeah, deconstructively interfere. And at the end, you are uh, in the regime of this coherent perfect absorption. Um, the point is that you have to match the mirror reflectivity and the absorption to the wavelength so that it works. It's not easy, so it's, yeah, it's just, it just works for one wavelength, for instance. Yeah? But it works, and they have shown that it works. Now, if you understand that, you can uh, transfer this to our experiment here, because we have essentially a similar situation in a nonlinear medium. So we have incoming matter waves from left and right, which are uh, yeah, given by the DC Jotterson currents that we induce. And here we have an absorptive media, so we have a local loss process. And we have kind of two, let's say, partially reflective mirrors, which are just the two wells. We just only, we only consider, consider, consider this part here. And I would just like to remind you that here we just see that there is a full lattice site here, so that there is no kind of density which goes out or which is referred to. This is also what the, uh, the solution of the Jotterson model tells you. But here is something different. I told you in the optics, it's not easy to make this. You really have to tune the mirrors and the absorption that it works. Here, it automatically appears. We do not tune anything. We just set one value of gamma, and then we end up in a state where everything that goes into the defect is absorbed. And the reason is that this is a nonlinear uh, system here. And this nonlinear system has some attractor dynamics. And indeed, this is the case for the Josephson model, because as soon as you increase uh, population imbalance, you have a, you induce a current which is compensating this imbalance here, and that leads you that you automatically end up in this situation here. So here the perfect absorption appears for every gamma. We are now thinking of more about uh, this type of, what, what, what in essence is this? This is describing this dissipative defect very much in terms of a scattering experiment, right? And 
we are now continuing to think about this direction and see what we can also learn about it if we look at this from this point of view. But this is what I wanted to tell you. It is a kind of a new understanding of the same phenomenon. Okay, that was it. I would like to thank uh, the people that are involved with that experiment. Currently, this is René Hamburger, uh, this is Chen Xiang, this is Christian Wals, Andreas Müllers, and Jens Benari, and there are also many former group members who have been involved with that. And that's it. I thank you for your attention. Questions? So, um, in the beginning, you discussed the information theory. Yeah. Um, how would an approximation be? You mean in terms of quantum fluctuations, yeah. the kind of the kind of kind of spoil it? For sure, we don't see anything that comes from quantum fluctuations up to now. I would say. Uh, also, in these. I mean, if you look at this type of, uh, where you have a few hundred at, or 80 atoms per lattice side here, I would still say it is probably good to describe with the weak field theory, as at least in the, in the, in the superfluid regime. Uh, certainly it will break down if you come to the few atom limit. But if this is five, ten atoms on a side already, I don't know. And I'm trying to, to find if there is some basic argument. It's a very continuous loss model. Yes. Rather than Yes, yes, yes. Maybe it's so like the... The chemical potential, for example, changes by adding and subtracting one or two... Stronger and than the loss rate. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that could be such a time argument. Yeah, that the, that the energy change in a fluctuation is comparable to gamma. Yeah, that would be an argument. Are yeah. you far away from this? At the moment, yes, I would say, yeah, we are. Yeah. A related question, or maybe the same question in the end, but uh, so originally when you started from the open quantum dynamics, it satisfies fluctuation dissipation theorem, right? But in the end, when you go to the Rosby-Dayevsky equation with this imaginary term, it clearly violates fluctuation dissipation here, right? Because you only have dissipation, zero fluctuation. So it's the fluctuation, isn't there any fluctuation from removing these atoms or is the fluence of the electron beam so high that you can neglect it, right? No, no, there are fluctuations. I think the point is just that we don't see them. You don't see in, in order to just the bare number of atoms with which the electron beam is interacting, uh, the next point is, which makes it difficult to observe experimentally, that we do not see all the ions, all the atoms that we remove. So we only see a part of it. So even if we see, we see, of course, we see fluctuations in the signal that comes out of it, but these fluctuations are uh, mainly or maybe exclusively due to the, the detection statistics and not to the statistics of the removing. removing. Because usually it just induces yeah. space fluctuations and this could destroy space coherence between left yeah. and right. That yeah. Here it is. You see su super close. Yeah, exactly. So although the phase coherence remains the same between the two sides here over this time scale. What, what, what is the key difference between the bulk BC and these factors of pancakes? Does it just come down to this moment narrative the economy? Why, um, why do they really behave so? so the, yeah, so the DC is not a perfect absorber, obviously, right? You have a hole, and you also see in the, in the, in the simulation of the cross PDF equation that you can have reflected parts. Um, I think it's the discreteness here that makes the difference. Because in this, so, so, so you boil it down to a very simple 1D situation, and in for that particular case, you can see it. And only there. I think in, I'm not sure if this survives, for instance, in 2D. You can think about it. To the area removing atoms there at the moment precisely. We haven't looked into that, but I think it's that. Yeah, I think it's the next slide or so where you're measuring the yeah talk. Okay. Um, that profile, that's that's the profile of transverse to the uh, to the lattice? Yes. Okay. Can you tell them about your estimate of um, that you should get filling at 10%. It's not obvious to me how you would you would model when you would form a condensate. There's a lot of different energy scales there and 
how we come to this number here that we accept yeah. the 10%, you yeah, see the, the comments yeah. Well, we looked into, into the 2D theory, uh, in a 2D model of the, of the lattice side with the, appro uh, with the appropriate uh, oscillation frequency. And then we were calculating the phase space density that you have, or how many atoms do you have to fill in there until you reach what are you assuming? For the, what are you assuming for sort of the energy scale, the atoms that go in, the tunneling in? They have lots of different levels. No, no this is just we just consider one isolated site, and and think of how many atoms do we have to put there until we reach the condition for condensation at, at temperature equal to zero, and that happens at about I think 80 atoms in the site, but a full site is about 800. Any other questions? Right. Thank you very much.